Shalom, my good people. And now let me look at this and make sure that everything's broadcasting good today. But today I want to go over uh, the book of Jude. Um, everyone knows my position already. And if you don't know, you should know that I am what you call a full preterist. That means I believe that the Bible has been fulfilled. And I believe that's what the New Testament was leading up to for those first century Jews to see the fulfillment of all those previous prophecies from uh, the older time in the Torah and the Tanakh come to pass through Christ. I believe that everything led up to Christ. Christ was the fulfillment of everything. The whole Bible is complete. And we are living in the spiritual kingdom in heaven. Um, the kingdom of heaven, from my understanding, was never supposed to be a, a kingdom upon the earth where you can literally go to and sit down and, and eat with the citizens just like you see in your, uh, your kingdom of today or the kingdoms that they experienced like in Babylon and all those places. I believe that the kingdom of heaven itself was always destined to be a spiritual place where the ideology or the things on your inside would be displayed and reflected from your actions. I believe that the kingdom of heaven starts within and it works its way outwardly into how you interact in society. Um, a reason why, one of the reasons why one of my foundations I can use from that is because the Most High Himself was ruling as king throughout all of the time. It's just Israel wanted a physical king, so he did what he did with physical Israel, but he still was still, but the Most High still was ruling over all the Gentiles and the settlers as king, uh, according to Daniel. So, the Most High, through all of that stuff, if you go in the Bible, you see people were dying, uh, raping was going on, and all that stuff. So the Most High was still reigning as a king throughout that time. So, bad things still was happening while the Most High was king over all. So, that wasn't supposed to change when Christ came around and got his kingdom. The thing was, Christ's kingdom is full of nothing but saints. See, the Most High reigned over everyone, the good and the bad, while Christ's, his kingdom, his specific kingdom, was only going to be a kingdom uh, composed of nothing but saints. So that will be the difference to me, in my understanding, dealing with the kingdom. So yes, I feel that the kingdom of heaven has been here uh, since the first century after the destruction of the temple. Uh, the Most High got rid of the Mosaic Covenant and um, allowing the age of Christianity or the New Age or the New Covenant Age or era, however you want to call it, to come about. And it has been ruling and reigning ever since. It's just people being wicked, doing wicked things. And we see the wicked stuff and we, for some reason, we think that it was supposed to stop. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. So now I have everything set up how I should, so I can begin. Um, I want to go into Jude and try to have a discussion about Jude today, because I believe Jude breaks down a whole lot of stuff, as well as, once again, proves that the kingdom of heaven was supposed to, was expected to come first century. Uh, sorry, y'all. Let me start up my incense. I got my uh, handmade uh, frankincense and myrrh. I'm gonna have this place in here smelling just like heaven. So, give me a minute to to uh, light my incense, and we'll get this party going. But I'd like to say shalom out there to all my beautiful Israelite family, as well as who we refer to as the Gentiles, but the whole group, the whole shebang bang will be spiritual Israelites. So if everyone is going to be spiritual Israelites, we're all family inside of the kingdom anyway. The kingdom is built upon us. So uh, hopefully this be edifying. So if you want to walk with me, Let's walk through Jude, and we'll see if Jude actually um, tells the story or explains how they was expecting Christ to return 
in the first century with his kingdom. Let's see if their ideology is there. So, I want to touch on Jude. We know it's only one chapter, but I want to get in detail of some of the information. Now, I hope that I'll be able to go between screens. I don't know, but I hope so. I'll just keep, keep my fingers crossed. But anyway, and I can go right now. I'm going to try to start this. So right now, let's go here. And I'm going to try to find Jude out of the King James Version Bible. Okay. We have Jude. All right. Bet. So we got that to work. <laughs> All right, so Jude 1 and 1. It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called mercy, sorry, and called mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. So now we have what they uh, has labeled as false teachers, judgment on false teachers, okay? Now we know that during Christ's uh, prophecy, he let it be known that it was going to be uh, uh, people coming in, in his name saying that, you know, that they were Christ and they was going to pretty much deceive a lot of people. But it was a judgment for those false teachers. So let's go through it. Uh, but I want to touch on other things also. I'm just trying to show you what they put. Uh, you have it right here. But Jude 1 and 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So now, he says that he wants to exhort unto those people who he was right in the first century that they should earnestly contend for the faith and which was once delivered unto the saints. So first thing first, we got to get whom the saints were or whom he is speaking to or whom he is talking about. So we'll venture off real fast. Let's venture off to Psalms 50. And let's go to 5. says, gather, Psalm 50 and 5, gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So we have it right here, right now, that the saints will be the ones who have made a covenant unto the Most High through sacrifice. Very key and important to understand who the actual saints are. So once we go through, we should know who the saints that he's speaking on is. The people that made a covenant with the Most High through sacrifice. So now, let's venture off into Psalms 148. Psalms 148, 14. He also exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even or indeed of the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Praise ye the Lord. So we have the saints being, as we all should know, the children of Israel. The children of Israel whom 
made a covenant unto the Most High through sacrifice. So, in the New Testament, we know that there was a different type of sacrifice. It was spiritual sacrifices instead of the physical sacrifices that was going on in the Mosaic Covenant. So, these people would be the ones doing these sacrifices. The New Covenant, spiritual sacrifices. The Mosaic Covenant, the animal sacrifices. But, those who will be the saints. So now, once we go back, venture back to Jude. I like this program. Once we go back to Jude 1 and 3, he says, uh, that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So now, let's go to what the faith is right now. Let's go to faith. Because this is what they was contending for. In the first century, this is what they was contending for. So now, let's go to Hebrews. And I like doing uh, uh, lessons like this that you're able to break down exactly what's all going on and what's all being said. So Hebrews 11, and let's go to uh, one first. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is the substance, it's something tangible that's been hoped for and the evidence, it comes true of things not seen by a spiritual means. In other words, they believed that it was going to occur, therefore it did occur. But it occurred through the Most High. It occurred through them believing on the Most High, them trusting on Christ, and the Most High or Christ delivering. So that's that faith that they was that they had to contend for, to believe what Christ was saying to believe Christ was this prophesied Messiah. They had to contend for and believe this. But let's keep going on. Now we go to Hebrews 11 and 6. Eleven is Hebrews 11 and 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please the Father. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So without faith, without believing and trusting on the Most High, for your every need, you cannot please him. You cannot, see that's the thing that was going on with the law. The law was more hands-on, and it gave people personal gratification. So they was doing it up to, unto themselves for their own gratification instead of the gratification of the Most High. That's for the law itself was never meant to last thousands of years. I mean, I think it made it up to 1,500 years, and it was done for. It wasn't meant to last three, 4,000 years or beyond. So, because this all man doing things for their benefit and using their actions in order to unrighteously judge other people. So, the Most High wanted you mainly to believe on him. That's why Israel kept getting uh, uh, cursed and kept getting uh, taken captive because when a prophet always came to warn Israel, guess what? They never believed the prophet. They didn't believe the prophet. They killed the prophet. And then they was uh, destroyed. Israel was destroyed every single time, even all the way up to the Messiah. So that faith is believing. That the, and you got to believe on the Most High and on this word truthfully, all of it in order to please him. So now let's go to uh, uh, 
And I hope the audio was coming through. Let's see. Romans 10, 17. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So now I'm just hitting on these little verses real fast. But faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So all of the things that the prophets were saying, that is what the faith came from, that believing on the Most High that he was going to be a righteous judge who was going to deliver all he said he was going to deliver through his son. And he was going to allow his son to sit on the throne, which was first given to David, and to rule and reign over all the saints. They had to believe all of this stuff, even through the persecution. Some people who, not, who didn't even know Christ, but they heard of Christ. And they heard of the miracles. They themselves had to believe on it. Now, back then, they, they actually had extra things like the, seeing the spirit or seeing the gifts in person. But even the Pharisees saw the healings and stuff in person, and they still didn't believe. They still said, hey, he does this through Beelzebub, or, or, he's a, or, or another means. He's not the Messiah. So... Even though they saw it, they still didn't believe it. See, the point was that kingdom is built off of spiritual things, built off of belief and trusting the Most High, trusting the Messiah 100%. That's what they had to contend for. And they was being faced with being put to death for that belief or being uh, persecuted for that belief. So they was contending for that type of faith. So now let's go back to Jude. Now, uh, let's see here. Now, hopefully you all are with me right now. Uh, I guess I might want to set up another, um, hold on, let me set up a, a, another, alive to see if I'm actually getting because a lot of things are going off. Sorry, let me cut it down. Because I don't know if I will ever get any questions or not. But let me continue on what I'm doing. I just got to see if you can ask some questions or anything. I wasn't able to see. But let's go now to Go back to Jude uh, 4 now. Yeah, I love this program. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bell, Mr. David, for uh, showing me this. Mr. Bell introducing me this uh, because this is actually working out perfect. So now, Jude 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemn condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Jesus Christ. So now, I want everybody to see this. For there are certain mean crept in unawares. So this was something going on in the first century. Okay? This is not a prophecy about us. This is what they was going through in the first century. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. So these men were prophesied about and sentenced to condemnation since the beginning of time. We can go all the way back to uh, uh, Genesis where the, where the snake was supposed to be
bruised by uh, the son or the seed of the woman. So, these are those individuals who are anti-Christ. These people was prophesied about in the old. You see, we can't take these people now who's doing all of this ungodly things in the name of the Lord and try to make the Bible be about them. No, these, this group of people that the Bible is talking about existed in the first century. And those prophecies about those wicked people were created in the Old Testament. So now, these people were ordained before of old, before the Old Covenant, before all of that, they were ordained to condemnation. They are considered as ungodly men. They turned the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and Christ. See, these people not only denied the Father, they also denied the Son. See, this is how you know that this is about the first century. Because this is when Christ was on the scene, the first century. So we're just reading that history. So all of those things that you read about in the uh, in the Old Testament, in the Torah, about that that unfroid generation, that um, that generation that was lacking empathy, and all of that. In fact, let's see if. Uh, I'm just going to turn it here real fast in my Bible so I want to put it up. Let's see if we can find it real fast. Um, let's see here. They was called a forward generation. Deuteronomy 32 and 20. Uh, they was called a crooked gen uh, generation. Deuteronomy 32 and 5. All these people was that that generation that was going to be a latter day in person generation. So that was these people in the first century. So now let's see. Let me see if I can actually get this real fast. Uh, I'm going to try it. Yep. One and four right here. Continent 50. This is what lasciviousness means. Um, filthy, wantonness, continent. But that's what they were. They were filthy individuals. Now, let's go to, let's look at that because they were, what were they doing? They were denying the Lord Father and the Lord Son. So let's go look at some of this. Let's see if we can find some of this being fulfilled in the first century. Remember, we got what false prophets and teachers here, and in Jude we had what the judgment of those false prophets and teachers. Even these people putting this stuff together, they're trying to keep you on the right path. But anyway, let's go. It says first uh second Peter two and one. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who shall privately sorry, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves uh, swift destruction. So, these people, these false teachers, these false prophets, they were in the first century, and they were coming upon the congregation of those Christians who were getting ready to go through persecution, who was already experiencing persecution, who was, uh, you know, going over into the faith of Christianity from the Torah-only aspect. 
So you had these individuals coming in and denying that the Most High taught uh, or sent the prophets to prophesy about this occurring. And then you have the same, uh, in the same instance, you have these same people saying that Christ was not the Messiah. He was not really the Christ. And you have pretty much the same thing. You have a reflection of it today when you have a person tell you, hey, don't listen to that New Testament. Don't, don't go into the New Testament because the Romans created that, you know. This, this, this Roman literature, without any true information to back it up, and even though Israelites went into the Assyrians and learned their culture, went into the, Babylon, the Babylon, Babylonians and learned their culture, the Medo Persians and learned their culture, went into the Greeks and learned their culture, went into Rome and learned their culture. They want you to base your salvation off of a language and a group of people because they don't like what the people look like. They want you today to deny Christ because he was born during the Roman Empire and the things written about him was during the Roman Empire in the Grecian language, which makes perfect sense since the Grecian language was the most popular language in that time. And Christ was born under the time that the Grecian language was, was popular. So, yes, yeah, some of the Hebrews still knew uh, Hebrew. And yes, Christ could speak Aramaic uh, and Hebrew. But the disciples chose to write the New Testament in the Greek language. Now there is a uh, uh, Hebrew Matthew also, but if you if you go through the information, you understand that the scholars actually believe that Mark's gospel was written first anyway. So the Hebrew Matthew would be after the Greek Mark. But that's beside the point. Let's go back to the first century now. I'm showing you a parallel today. Not saying that these are the same events at all. I'm showing you that this stuff right here is still happening today. Even though this time Peter is talking about was a first century only time. So this is what's going on. So we see the fulfillment where, where uh, Jude was talking about right here. Peter was saying the same thing. But let's, we, can, we can go on. Let's go to Second Peter 10 to 14. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanliness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self will. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. So they spoke against government. They didn't want to be ruled by anybody except themselves. They did not like the order that the Most High set up or had them under. They spoke against all of the people that was over them. Verse 11. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not really accusation against them before the Lord. So the angels is more powerful than all these people. And you don't even see them going before the Most High uh, creating all of these uh, accusations. But anyway, verse 12. But these, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understood not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. See, these people, they did not understand Christ's uh, fulfillment. They did not understand the prophecies. Same, we had the same people today who don't understand the prophecies. They read something and say, hey, look, that was filled by, that was fulfilled by David. Hey, look, that was fulfilled by, by uh, this king. Look, that king did that. Uh, uh, this man did that. That man fulfilled that in the Old Covenant. Not understanding that they was just a type and the true fulfillment was through Christ. 
So when Christ opened up the disciples' eyes, or when um, the disciples taught people of Christ, what did they do? They went back into the Torah and the Tanakh, and then they had to explain to the people what the true meaning behind what they reading was actually about. So yes, you could see a fulfillment in the Tanakh or the Torah of, of Moses or Caleb or, or Solomon or any other person. But the true meaning behind it was through the king, the Messiah. And these people did not understand it. And look what Peter said. They were as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. These people that brought these accusations up against the government, up against Christ, these people that brought the heresies in the church, these people that tried to turn you away from Christ and the faith, those people, and I'm speaking of from a Peter's point of view. I'm not saying these people as in people today. I'm speaking like I'm Peter. These people are to be destroyed. They were made to be taken and destroyed. When John uh, in Matthew 2, I believe, when he uh, prophesied against the Pharisees and asked them who warned them to flee from the judgment to come, these are those people that were made to be destroyed because they had no faith in them. They were never children of Abraham. Never. But anyway, verse 13, and, it shall, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. Once again, unrighteousness. See, in the new covenant, things start being based off of righteous acts, off of faith, off of love, off of doing things for your family. You know, righteous things, the things that Abraham had to do. Noah, uh, Abel, all of those righteous things not condemned by a law saying you have to do this, 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 or that or I will destroy you. No, it's not built off of that. It was built off of righteousness, a person choosing to do the right thing, not having to look at a letter to determine what is right or wrong, but them knowing what's right or wrong automatically. That's him writing the law on your heart, actually. But anyway, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. See, they was unrighteous. Even though they had the Torah, even though they followed the Mosaic Covenant and still didn't even do that right, but they thought they was doing the most highest work because they did not understand the prophecies and they didn't want to learn them. These were unrighteous people created in the first century for slaughter as they count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They're all at your Jewish festivals. Y'all having a good old time doing all these uh, mosaic laws. I mean, y'all are doing it. Y'all are having the best time in the world. But they had so many blemishes. blemishes. They were deceitful people, people, deceiving men, trying to beguile people, trying to take people from the faith of Christ. These men were set for destruction. Look, verse 14. Having, sorry, having eyes full of adultery, and they not not doing adultery, but their eyes full of adultery. Remember uh, what, what Christ say? If a man look upon a woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery. So having eyes full of adultery, and they cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have and heart they have exercised with covetous practices. They were cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam. Of Balaam. We'll go through that later. But anyway, these people, 
they were talking against the faith and against Christ and against the Father. So now, uh, let's see here. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. So, if you deny Christ in the first century, by default, you deny the Father who sent Christ. So, those people who was uh, going against the Lord and the Son, you see what's going on here. They were denying Christ and creating these heresies amongst the men. Titus 1, 15 through 16. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled, and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. You see why they couldn't understand the, the, the prophecies? Why they couldn't understand that Christ was the Christ? They were defiled consciously. Remember he said, eyes full of adultery? It was things not right on their inside. So they were meant for destruction. They professed that they know God. But in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate, a reprobate. So now, we still see the reflection today. People out here today trying to take people to Christ, want to tell people, uh, hey, you know, there's a better way to do things, you know. Uh, you're worrying too much more about eating pork and then instead of helping your brothers and sisters out. Uh, go out there and teach people. Tell people, you know, how blessed they are instead of how cursed they are. That's what we go through today. And people tell us, no, I'm under the mosaic covenant. You're going to die. You're going to perish. You're going to burn in hell. The most, uh, sorry, Christ is going to come back with his sword and he's going to kill you, brother. You a coon. You're going to die. There's no Christianity. Christianity is fake. It's false. The most high don't want you in, in a religion. He wants you following culture to the T. He wants you following a covenant not even meant for you. No, these people now cannot see the same things what the people back then could not see. Because they are not pure. They have no faith. They want everything through works. And when somebody is doing good works for Christ, they talk against them. They say, no, don't follow that brother. Don't follow that sister. They don't know what they're talking about. They are the ones prophesying in the Bible. You hear what that brother saying? Christ and I already came back. That's the false prophets uh, prophesied in the Bible. That's about them. That's about him. That's about her. No, it's not. We're actually saying what Christ actually taught. You're seeing the good work, and you're trying to make it abundant. Same thing they was doing back then. But I'm just showing you that this is the mindset that they had back then, all of the wicked people. And we have that same, people have that same mindset today, but the only difference is this was a first century problem that had a first century solution through Christ returning. Today, we have the same problem, but our solution is different because we are in the kingdom. And the people who's not, they're outside of the kingdom. They don't have the grace of the Most High. They don't have the authority that, that, that Christ can give them. They don't have that. They only have blessings of people with no covenant and no promises. That's what they have. So now, he also said, uh, uh, let's see here. Condemnations, right? So, Let's go back to Jude 1. 
4, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. So, let me see if I can take that off. Of that thing. And I'll go off. Um, I guess once it's on there, it's on there. Well, I'm pretty sure it's a way to get off. Uh, let's see here. Uh, black. Oh, white. Let's try white. Okay, yeah, okay, there we go. It said ordained to this condemnation. Okay, so let's see here. Because from the beginning, it was spoken of them, and they was ordained to this condemnation. So from the beginning, from Torah, it was spoken of these people. In the first century. Try this one more time, and I'm just gonna go with it. Still uh, working out the kinks. Okay, there we go. Deuteronomy 32:16. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations. Provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to gods. To God whom they knew not. So to gods whom they knew not. To new gods they came. They came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock they begat, thee that are unmindful, and has forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw thee, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and his daughters. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. See, all of, we see all of this being fulfilled in the New Testament. All of this was spoken of in the Torah, being fulfilled finally in the New Testament. Uh, 32.22 For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn into the lowest hell, and consume the earth with her increase, and set fire, set on fire the foundations of the mountains, which we see this all throughout Revelation. I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them, all throughout Revelation. They shall be burnt with hunger, and devoured with burning heat, and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth, the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. All in Revelation. The sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of great hairs. I said I will scatter them into corners. I will make a remembrance of them cease to cease from among men. All happened first century. When Rome destroyed uh, Jerusalem. That's Luke 21 24. Were it not that I feared the wrath, and I'm talking about the last time that it happened. After this happened, Israel was no longer thought of. Were, were, were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should have behaved, sorry, should behave themselves strangely. Unless they should say, our hand is high, and the Lord hath not done all this. So in other words, saying, this ain't the most high wrath. 
This is just something else. The Most High didn't have nothing to do with us being destroyed. It was ourselves. We did it, and, and etc. Uh, people are, 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 are mean. They're hateful. People are just in being in their human nature. There's nothing that the Most High did. Rome didn't come uh, sack Jerusalem because the Israelites were doing anything bad. No, they did it just because they were wrong and they wanted to do wickedness. So now, verse 32. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them, or that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end, the end of them, the time of their end which happened in the first century. But this is the prophecy that was against those Israelites. This is the prophecy against them. Let's read a uh, few more prophecies about them. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. And we see Christ saying, you know, Luke 21, uh, 22. Check it out. Let me make sure I gave you the right one. I always a data on that. Luke 21, yep, 22. To me belongs the vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand. And the things that shall come upon them make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants. When he said that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, where are their gods, their rock on whom they trusted? Which did eat of the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. See now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. If I whip my glittering sword and my enemies take, and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh, and that the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenge is upon the enemy. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and will render vengeance to his adversaries. And will be merciful unto, unto his land and, and to his people. So all of this was spoken to the Israelites to let them know that eventually they were going to be, uh, be judged and destroyed. And the people was going to rejoice. Those certain people, those certain individuals were going to rejoice when those wicked Israelites were destroyed. The people, look. Revenge is, uh, uh, they have slain, avenged the blood of his servants. We see the same thing in Revelation, dealing with the whore of Babylon, or the mystery of Babylon, or uh, uh, the harlot, right? whatever you want to call it. She was full of the blood of the saints. Who was killing the saints? None other but the, than the Israelites. They were killing the servants of Christ the people who was listening to Christ, so that vengeance was supposed to be rendered unto them. All of this, this judgment, this is the last great judgment. That, white, that great white throne judgment, this is actually it. This is it. The Lord shall judge his people, for the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his service. In Revelation let me just show y'all real fast, so and then we're going to pop off of this. The Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his, serv uh, for his servants. 
to the most high belong vengeance and recompense, right? He shall judge his people, right? Let's see what else we have. He will render vengeance, right? He will avenge the blood of his servants, right? And will render vengeance to his adversaries, right? So now, you go to Luke 21. 20 through 22, sorry, through 24. This is the last judgment. Then the Bible is complete. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is not. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. We just read it in Deuteronomy 32. This is the latter. This was supposed to happen at their latter end. You don't have another end after the latter end. The latter is the last. The last end. No more ends after the last end. So this was a last end judgment. This is what the great white throne judgment was all about. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people, the people of the Most High. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. This was all a first century, last time generation, a uh, judgment. And then once you go to Re uh, Revelation 6, and 10 right here. Well, 9 and 10. It says, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held was through Christ. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also, also and their brethren, these are all Israelites, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So, the, before the Most High avenged those saints, which is what Deuteronomy 32 was talking about, a few more people had to be killed. And then I'm going to go to the final thing, and then we're going to go right back to Jude. Then you go to Matthew 23, and this is Christ talking to the Pharisees. Matthew 23 and 30, and said, if we had... Woe to the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye, ye, scribes and Pharisees, build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. These are Israelites who's doing this, not the Roman army, not anybody else except Israelites. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partaken with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Who killed the prophets? The Israelites. Not anybody else. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Remember, a few more had to be killed. At this time, a few more had to be killed. See, Christ is making this prophecy around 30-something A.D. It was fulfilled, uh, the, the vengeance was fulfilled in 70 A.D. So they had about 40-something years 
from this prophecy that Christ is telling them right now to the prophecy being fulfilled. It was like 40 something years. But anyway, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Not everybody in the world, not people in the 21st century, but the people in the first century. How could they escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I, this is Christ, send unto you prophets, unto who? The Pharisees and scribes. Wherefore, I behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, this is that vengeance. This is the vengeance that, that the Most High was talking about right here when he was going to avenge those that died. This is that vengeance right here. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel, that's Genesis, unto the blood of Zacharias, that's New Testament, son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, who is he talking to? The scribes and the Pharisees, not people in the 21st century. All these things, all these things, the things that he just called right here, all of that vengeance, all these things shall come upon this, this, generation, not that generation, not 2,000 years in the future generation, but that final judgment, that vengeance, those saints being avenged was going to come upon that generation 2,000 years ago. That's why he said this generation, Christ is talking to them. And look, he finished it. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that killest the prophets and stone them which are sent unto thee. Who did it? Jerusalem. Not the Americas, not China or Russia, but Jerusalem. In verse 38, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. That's the destruction of the temple. Right there. That's the final judgment. That's the end of the Mosaic covenant. The end of the Mosaic laws. The end of anything dealing with Moses was going to end right here for that final judgment in that generation. That's why we know the Bible is complete. But now, that's the condemnation. And one more, and then we can go right back to, um, and I'm just trying to break it to you thoroughly, and we'll go right back. So Psalms 1, let's see here. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Remember, those ungodly people are the ones that were against Christ. They was the one that was leading people astray. They was the one that was bringing in the heresies. Those will be those were the ones that's killing the prophet. These were the ungodly people. Not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor set it in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. This was a Mosaic Covenant theme. The Mosaic Covenant did not come to a complete end until the, after the destruction, after the final judgment, 70 AD. So the, they were still under the Mosaic Covenant here. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. They bring it forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. See, once again, these people were spoken of, their condemnation was spoken of in the old. So we had to go to the old to see the condemnation of those people. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. See, y'all see this right here? You see righteous. 
righteous. The new covenant is all a righteous thing. Now, they could get this through the law, but they never did it right in order to in order to achieve this righteousness. All of the righteousness was brought through by faith. But look, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So this is all the condemnation, right? Let's see if we got any questions or comments or anything. Uh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing here. Give me one second. I'm sorry. Now I wouldn't say that the sorry, I wouldn't say that the saints uh I'm just looking at the video uh um uh, um comments now. No, I wouldn't say that the saints were only Israelites because in the new covenant, anybody who created who did spiritual sacrifices will be considered saints. And anybody under the new covenant could do a spiritual sacrifice, no matter if they were Jew or Gentile. So now Back to, once again, I'm showing that I didn't prove that Christ had already returned for his final coming. But let's keep going through Jude. Let's go to Jude 1 and 5 now. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, Afterward, afterward, destroyed them that believed not. So now, we got to go through a few instances, you know. Because now he's bringing things back into their remembrance of the things that happened to the Israelites. Once again, this is an Israelite thing. The Lord destroyed uh, the people that believed not. So he said, put you in remembrance that you once knew this. So he's talking to Israelites about Israelite culture, about things that Israelites should remember. Numbers 40 or 1422 because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. Same thing was going on in the New Testament. Um, they were provoking the Most High through not believing on His Son. Therefore, they were going to be destroyed and not enter into that land, which was the heavenly land, the heavenly Jerusalem. This all was a shadow, a reflection. But now, let's keep going. Um, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and had followed me fully, him would I bring into the land where until he went and his seed shall possess it. That's pretty much symbolic for the new Christians. But anyway, well, the Christians of the first century. But anyway, now the Amaleks and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. This would be symbolic to the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Torah followers. Tomorrow, turn you and get and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, 
which they murmured against me. So all this, the Amalekites, the Canaanites, the, these things that the children of Israel, it's all is symbolic, or to me it all represents what was going on in the first century. But anyway, this is the actual being, this is actually it being played out. But to me, this was the bigger uh, story was in the first century. But anyway, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, as truly as I live, said the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Your, carcass, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and up, upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning, which I swear to make you dwell therein. Save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, uh, Jephunneh yeah, and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones, which you said should be a prey, then will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcass shall fall in the wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be, weighed, be wasted in the wilderness. So all of this is symbolic from when Christ died all the way up into that final judgment. After the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities. To where I go to, sorry. Even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. So we pretty much got it right there. Uh, that was the things that they forgot, right? And then we'll see here. Number six, 26, 64. But among these, there were not a man of them whom Moses and Aaron the priests numbered when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, they, should, they shall surely die in the wilderness. And there was not left a man of them save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. So we have the Most High coming through what he said, correct? And then let's we'll see. Uh, all the people that believed not were destroyed. And the people forgot this. They forgot that type of judgment. They forgot all of that. So Jude was bringing it back into their memories. The book of Jude was created to bring it right back into their remembrance. Psalms 106.21 They forgot God their Savior which had great, done great things in Egypt. See? this They forgot it before. Jude was able to even talk about this and pull from this. So, I mean, you could see how this was correlating to the first century or the time of the end. The same ideology. They forgot God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said that he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. See, the Most High was willing to destroy Israel from the beginning until Moses, the mediator, spoke up for him. Yea, they despise the pleasant land. They believe not his words. Once again, you see the word believed right there? This is all about faith. They believe. They did not, without faith, you cannot please the Most High. And they believe not his words. They didn't have faith in the Most High's words. But murmured in their tents and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore, he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their seeds among the nations, and to scatter them in the lands. And the last one.
Hebrews 3.16-19. For some, when they had heard, did provoke how they not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, who carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They did not have the faith. They murmured against the Most High. See, the people forgot the importance of believing the Most High. And they forgot the judgment that came along with not believing the Most High. The people forgot about all of this in the first century. They said, we have not been slaves. Kill this man. All of that stuff. Not fearing the Most High, not believing Thinking, man, it, it just got crazy there. Well, anyways, Hebrews 4, 1 and 2. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of. For unto us was the gospel preached. See, the gospel right here. As well as unto them. So they received the gospel. And the first century received the gospel of the promise, of the promised land of entering into the true rest, reconciling with the Most High. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So they heard it, but they didn't have faith. They did not believe in the Most High. They did not believe in His word. What did they say? We see giants in the land. The Most High told them, I'm going to give you that promised land for you to go possess it. That's your land. You're going to possess it. But they didn't believe it. They just rather murmur against the Most High. Therefore, they were destroyed. But now, let's see. Jude 1 to 6. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So, he's, Jude is going through, the book of Jude is going through everyone that was destined to be destroyed or that was destroyed for not listening to and fearing and having belief in the Most High. So now, let's, uh, let's see. Uh, so now, um, hey again, um, I, I think y'all see uh, where this is heading to. We're going to go now, we're going to venture off into a little of the, the story behind these angels that left, that did not keep their habitation but went down in sin, and they were still waiting for that judgment to occur on that last and great day. First century, destruction of the temple. They were waiting. They were going to be judged on that day. So that's what we have going on. So now we've got to venture off into a little of that information. Let's see here. I thought I had it pulled up, but I did not. Uh, give me one second. Let's see if I can pull it up real fast. Uh, let's see here. Might try to be difficult. Okay, here we go. Let's see if it happens. It might pull it up and it might not. We'll see. Um, and I thought I had it pulled up, but if it don't pull up, I just read it. All right. Um, 
Um, it don't look like it's going to pull up, so I'll just read it. Let's venture off into the book of Enoch. to the book of Enoch so we can actually read um, some of this. Let's see if I have any questions. Okay, so now Enoch 6 1 through 7 it says, and it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born to them beautiful and fair daughters. Uh, and that goes back with Genesis 6, 1 through 3. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and that they and they took many wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for this, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. So it shows you that this was all fleshly people. This was not really uh angels. But anyway, verse two, and the angels, the son of the sons of heaven, saw and lusted after them, and said unto one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and have children with them and Sim, and Sim Jaza, who was their leader said unto them I fear you will not agree okay it just pulled up right there let's see here Well, you got chapter 7 here. So, uh, let me see how it looks here. Uh, sorry, y'all. We got it right here. So, let's try here. I'm going to start right here. And then their leader, Samyaza, said to them, I fear that you may perhaps be indisposed to the performance of this enterprise, and that I alone shall suffer for so grievous a crime. But they answered him and said, We all swear and bind ourselves by mutual excreations that we will not change our intention, but execute our projected undertaking. Then they swore all together and bound all themselves by mutual excreations. Their whole number were 200 who descended upon Argus, which is the Mount Armon or the Mount Harmon. So now, let's see here. All right, that was chapter 7. So now let's see. Enoch. Let's see what happened when these so-called angels went up unto these daughters of men. Uh, Enoch 8, in some books, is going to be chapter 7, but anyway. Now, moreover, Azazel taught men to make swords, knives, shields, breastplates, the fabrications of mirrors, and the workmanship of bracelets and ornaments, the use of paint, the beautifying of the eyebrows, the use of stones of every valuable and selected kind, and all sorts of dyes, so that the world became altered. So now, we see Azazel, Azazel teaching mankind how to make things of war, and teaching women how to make things of seduction. So he was teaching women how to be uh, become more whores and how to seduce man instead of being modest. And he was teaching mankind how to uh, come up with different ways to perform war. 
Now let's see. Impiety increased. Fornication multiplied. Of course, impiety increased because they had different weapons to kill people real quick. And fornication multiplied because now they was beautifying their eyebrows and they was taking the, they was making sorts and colors and dyes of all things, changing up their hair, altering how they looked, no longer being looking a modest for the most high, but they changed their appearance, what you pretty much see today when women's doing with the makeup and all of that stuff. It wasn't like that in the beginning, everybody was natural. But now, this is what was going on. So, of course, in piety increased and fornication multiplied. And that they transgressed and corrupted all of their ways. Amazarach taught all the sorcerers and dividers of roots. So now you have drugs coming around. Almost taught the solution of sorcery. So now you have them different ways to uh, manipulate the elements. Barkayar taught the observer of the stars. So now you got stargazing and all this stuff. Achabel taught signs. Tamiel taught astronomy. And Azaradel taught the motion of the moon. And men being destroyed cried out, and their voice reached up to heaven. So the men that were not partaking in all of the evilness, the men that was trying to be for the Most High, they all were destroyed, and they cried out to heaven. They didn't need a law right now. See, this is before there was a Mosaic covenant, a Mosaic law. Okay? They still was able to cry out to heaven, and the Most High was able to respond to them without a Mosaic law. All right. But let's see here. We're reading all of the things that they did. Let's see which one I want to go to now. Let's see. Hmm. All right, we got it right here. Let's see. All right, sorry, y'all. These are kind of off. So now we have chapter 9. Then Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, Sarayel, and Uriel looked down from heaven and saw the quantity of blood. So these people were being unrighteous. They were killing people. So, see, you didn't need the law of Moses for killing people to be against the most high. Okay? You didn't need the covenant of Moses in order to understand that killing was wrong. So, so the quality of blood which was shed on, on the earth and all the iniquity which was done upon it. So you didn't need the law of Moses to have iniquity. Okay? The law of Moses was conditional. It was, it was temporary. It wasn't well, permanent. So now, and said one to another, it's the vo it, it is the voice of their cries. The earth deprived of her children has cried even unto the gate of heaven. And now to us, O you, Holy One of Heaven, the souls of men complain, saying, Obtain justice for us. So the souls of men back then were saying, Avenge us, Lord, the Most High. Then they said to their Lord, the King, You are Lord of Lords, God of Gods, King of Kings. The throne is your glory. The throne of your glory is forever and ever. See, the Most High was ruling back then. When these men were on earth being killed, when those women were being raped, the Most High still was ruling from his throne. Okay? So, slavery, Christ was still ruling from his throne even though slavery occurred. Okay? But anyway, forever and ever in, in your name, sanctified and glorified. You are blessed and glorified. 
Ye have made all things, you possess power over all things, and all things are open and manifest before you. You behold all things, and nothing can be concealed from you. So the, notice the angels didn't go down there and just start uh, wiping off mankind because they saw injustice, but they went through the power. They had to ask the king what could they do in order to rectify the situation. They just didn't go down there and start representing but anyway, you have seen what Azazel has done, how he had taught every species of iniquity upon earth and has disclosed to the world all the secret things which are done in the heavens. So all of the things that were done in heavens, we see that Azazel uh, taught the people on earth with the different color of the dyes. So we know that there's different colors in heaven. With the, uh, with the weapon tree. So we know that there's different weapons in heaven. Pretty much dealing with the wars, the spiritual wars. But anyway, um, what else did he teach them? Uh, well, he taught them the weapons and the, the color and the dyes and the, how to use uh, glycerin stones and all of that stuff. All of the things in heaven, that's what he taught. But anyway, Samyaza also has taught sorcery to whom you have given authority over those who are associated with him. They have gone together to the daughters of man, have lain with them, have become polluted, and have discovered crimes to them. It says discovered crimes or revealed these sins. The women likewise have brought forth giants. Thus has the whole earth been filled with blood and with iniquity. And now behold, the souls of those who are dead Cry out. See? These souls were of dead people. They were in Sheol crying to the Father to avenge their death and complain even to the gate of heaven. Their groaning ascends. What? Their what? Their groaning. They were groaning because of the iniquity of the people in the earth. So, this one groaning, groaning occurs through iniquity. And in the, in the uh, Mosaic law, groaning occurred to uh, them being under their covenant because it always brought forth curses. So it was always groaning, uh, dealing with uh, iniquity and being treated neg uh, negative. But anyway, nor can they escape from the unrighteousness which is committed on the earth. Once again, unrighteousness. Not breaking commandments and covenants, but unrighteousness. Everything was based off of righteousness and unrighteousness in the beginning, and that's what the new covenant went back to. Righteous and unrighteous, which was committed on earth. You know all things before they exist. You know these things and what has been done by them, yet ye do not speak to us. What on account of these things are we to do to them? So they said, Most High, you see all of this stuff going on earth. You knew it was going to happen, but you haven't told us. See, the angels were wanting to go out for mankind. The angels was wanting to represent for mankind, but the Most High did not give them instructions. Okay, so now we can go to chapter 10, and I'm about to wrap up uh, Enoch. Chapter 10, okay. Then the Most High, the Great and Holy One, spake and sent Ashel, Ashelah, <laughs> to the son of Lamech. It says, Ashelah, here one Greek text reads, Uriel, good, so Uriel, saying, say to him in my name, conceal yourself. So you, even the angels had to speak in the Most High's name. Then explain to him, the consummation which is about to take place. For all the earth shall perish. The waters of deluge shall come over the whole earth, and all things which are in it shall be destroyed. So was these giants over here in the Americas, or was this something happening over there in the east? So that would be the earth that they knew. Okay, y'all? That would be the earth, the world that they knew. What they lived in, okay? He wasn't trying to flood over here in the Americas. 
because of something they did over there in the east. Okay, but anyway, look, it says, explain to him the consummation which is about to take place. And what happened at that consummation? What happened at that consummation? All the earth was to perish. Everybody over there in that land was to perish. Was they? No, because we know some people survived. First of all, he gave warnings. He gave signs. He told them, he warned the righteous people what was going to occur, first of all. So he did the same thing. But I want to concentrate on them. The consummation which is about to take place for all the earth shall perish. So now, let's venture over. Let's venture over into. Let me get here. Daniel 9 and 27, dealing with the seven weeks. And after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. People say there's different people. I say there's Christ. But not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, we read that in Luke 21, 24. This is about 70 AD. This is about that last judgment, that last destruction in 70 AD. But look, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And until the end of the war, desolations are determined. So this is a war going on. Okay, everybody? I don't know why people leave that out. This is a war going on. The war destroyed the city and the sanctuary. This was in Daniel's time, prophesying about something that was going to occur during the fourth beast, which was the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem by the Roman army. But listen, let's keep reading. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So this is all about around the time of Christ, first century. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. That's the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. Luke 21 said this will be the Roman army. But notice the overspreading of abominations with an S. But you can go into Josephus and find out what that is. But anyway, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Let's see if we can find it real fast. Even until the consummation. Kala. A completion. A verbally completely. Also destruction. Altogether. Consume. Consummation. Full. And so until the consummation, until the completion, until the destruction, until the end, the riddance, good riddance, the end, and that shall be determined. So the end of all was supposed to occur during those 70 weeks. And we have Christ on the scene. So you can't separate the consummation. You can't separate the end. So let me go back to here. You can't separate the end right here. The consummation. The time of the end. You can't separate that end from Christ's timeline. You have Christ being cut off. And then you have one week passing. And then the consummation. So people will want you to believe that this Christ being cut off in the first century and that one week is 
2,000 years or more, and then the consummation is supposed to occur. But they forget about the overspreading of abomination that shall make it desolate. So that overspreading of abomination shall be make Jerusalem, shall make the sacrifices and the oblations stop. And it shall pretty much bring an end to all that under the Mosaic Covenant. So when was that consummation? When was that abomination of desolation determined? When did the abomination of desolation occur? And then the war ended, which ended all things. When was that? We just read it earlier. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The time of the Gentiles would be the consummation. When the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, that consummation is fulfilled. So now people want you to believe that the time of the Gentiles actually lasted still till today. From the time that Rome destroyed Jerusalem all the way up until today. But you go to Revelation 11 and 2. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot. We just read it in Daniel 9 and right 26. They shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. We read that also in Luke 21. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. So now in Revelation 11 and 2. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city they shall tread underfoot. Once again, what did Luke call it? Luke called it. Sorry, y'all, he's going back and forth, but we got to get in details with it. Luke called it until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled until the time of the Gentiles. So Luke called it the times. Let me try to get it. The times of the Gentiles, which is the consummation in Daniel, the completion. And Revelation called the time of the Gentiles. Forty two months. So how you get two thousand years from three and a half years? I don't know. I just know it took. Uh, Rome three and a half years to completely destroy Jerusalem. 66 AD summer into 70 AD. So it took Rome 42 months and some change to destroy Jerusalem and people and this once again this will be the consummation in Daniel the completion the end right here. 42 months after the city be tread. See, the city was to be tread underfoot the entire 42 months, the entire three and a half years. So they was never supposed to stop treading. And you see the word tread right there? Once you go into, into loop. You have trial. Tread trial. Same words, different um, uh, instances. So, but anyway, I just thought that consummation 
was very important. So now let's go back to, man, I love this program. <laughs> but anyway, so now that consummation ended that first world and the new world came after. See, this earth, see, see, for all the earth shall perish. So this earth perished. This earth left. So now, when Noah came off the boat, he came to a brand new earth. The Most High didn't have to go and create a whole totally different earth. But he created a brand new earth starting with new people, well, pretty much the same people in a new way, as well as the animals in a new way. So the, he did it again once he destroyed the covenant people. He only dealt with those people. So now he decided to deal with everybody. So once he destroyed that covenant, a new earth came with new people under Christ, with a new way of doing things under Christ. But now, let's keep reading. The waters of the deluge shall come over the whole earth, and all things which are in it shall be destroyed. And now teach him how he may escape, and how his seed may remain on earth. Again, the Lord said to Raphael, bind Azazel, hand and foot, cast him into darkness, and opening the desert which is in Dudiel, cast him in there. Throw upon him hurdle and pointed stones covering him with darkness. There shall he remain forever. Cover his face that he may not see light, see the light. In the great day of judgment, let him be cast into the fire. So now, first he's supposed to remain there forever, right? But now we see him being cast into the lake of fire. So, forever doesn't literally mean forever. It means into a certain point. So, he remained forever until judgment day which was that certain point, and then he was going to be cast into that fire. This same judgment occurred during 70 AD because it was the final judgment. No more judgments after that. But let's keep going. Uh, let's see here. I'm at uh, 6... And it is, let's see here, I think, give me one second, uh, people. Give me one second. It's 25, I'm at 6. I think I'm going to stop at, today I'm going to stop at verse 8. So I'm about to wrap this up right now, but I'm going to stop at verse 8. But let's keep reading. Now let's go to Jubilees. Let's see here. Jubilees. Jubilees. Uh, I love this program. Jubilees 5, so it's right here. So let me find out what 5 starts at. I went all the way back, didn't I? That's 2, 3, Four, five, right here. And it happened when the sons of the children of men commenced to increase over the face of the whole earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the angels of the Lord saw them in one year of this jubilee, 
that they were beautiful to look upon. And, and they took unto themselves wives from all them whomever they chose. And they bore them sons, and these were giants. So these people are taking these wives, right, by force. They take the wives, whoever they chose to have, they took them to the Most High, never wanted you to have another man's wife. He didn't care about the, poly, the polygyny, but you couldn't take another man's wife. If a wife already belonged to another man or was in fleshly uh, union with another man, you couldn't come take her. That's what they was doing. They was taking whoever they chose. But anyway, too. And injustice increased over the earth, and all flesh corrupted its way, from men to animals and to beasts and to birds and to all that walks upon the earth. See, if the man with the males were doing this stuff, it threw off the whole foundation of the whole earth. Even the animals start acting crazy. Let's see here. I think I went up too far. Yeah, I did go too far. That was easy, too. All corrupted. Uh, let's see here. That's verse 2. Their ways and their orders and began to devour each other. And unrighteousness increased over the earth. And all thoughts of the knowledge of all the sons of men were thus wicked all days. And the Lord looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh corrupted its order, and they all did evil before his eyes, all that were on the earth. And he said, I shall destroy mankind and all flesh that have been created above the face of the earth. But once again, we see that he did not destroy all flesh. He was making a point he was going to destroy uh, he was going to create a new creation. So he had to get rid of that old creation. So he created that new creation through some of the old creation. But anyway, and Noah alone found grace before the eyes of the Lord and concerning the angels, let's stop where I want to go. Yep. Whom he had sent upon the earth, he was greatly enraged that he would root them out of all their power. And he said to us, and he said to us that we should bind them in the depths of the earth. And behold, they are bound in the midst of them, depths and separate. And against their children came a word from the face of the Lord that they should be slain with a sword and be removed from under heaven. And he said, My spirit shall not always dwell with man, for they are flesh. And let their days be 120 years. And he sent unto them, and he said unto their midst his sword that each should slay his neighbor. So his sword was um, symbolic. That sword of his was symbolic to him making them be aggressive to each other to the point that they killed each other. And they began to slay one another. So this is the Hebrew mindset. So remember that when the Most High said, I'm going to send my sword upon them. I'm going to uh, uh, wash their blood. I have their blood in my sword. My glittering sword would be upon them. We see right here that that sword was actually them killing each other. And what did they? I mean, it all makes sense. But anyway, and they began to slay one the other until they all fell upon the sword and were destroyed from the earth. And their fathers witnessed it, and after this, these were bound in the depths of the earth until the day of the great judgment for the coming of punishment until eternity over all who have corrupted their ways and their works before the Lord. And he destroyed all their places, and there was not left a single one of them who was not judged according to their wickedness. How, would, how did he judge them? According to all their wickedness. How did the Most High judge those in the first century? According to all of their wickedness. So now, one more, and then we'll be wrapped up with this.
Start at verse 10. It says, uh, uh, the book of Jasher, verse, uh, um, the book of Jasher 4, verse 10. And all the days that Seth, Seth lived were 912 years, and he died. And Lamech was 180 years old when he took Ashmua, the daughter of Elisha, the son of Enoch, his uncle, and she conceived. And at that time, the sons of men sowed the ground, and a little food was produced. Yet the sons of men did not turn away from their evil ways, and they trespassed and rebelled against God. And the wife of Lamech conceived and bare him a son at that same time at the revolution of the year. And Methuselah called his name Noah. So we see right now that the sons of man were already doing evil, and the Most High was punishing them by not giving them food, but they still was doing more evil. Saying, the earth was in his days at rest and from and free from corruption. And Lamech, his father, called his name Menachem, saying, This one should comfort us in our works and miserable toil in the earth, which God had cursed. And the children grew up and was weaned, and he went in their way to the father. Methuselah, perfect and upright with God. And all the sons of men departed from their ways of the Lord in those days as they multiplied upon the face of the earth with sons and daughters. And they taught one another evil practices and they continued sinning against the Lord. Now who did it? All the sons of men. So we see one in, in a few instances they called them the children of heaven, the sons of heaven. But why? Because these people were supposed to be representing the heavenly court. They were supposed to be considered the children of God because they came from a holy line. So they were considered the children of God who knew more things, more heavenly things than the people on earth, than Cain's descendants. The people of the, the heavenly people are the people who adhere to the most high, they knew more heavenly things than the regular Cain, Cain uh, the people from Cain. Anyway, and look, they taught one another evil practices. And every man made himself, made unto himself a God, which we know, see, before there was even a law of Moses, the most high wasn't playing with that um, images of gods and stuff. And they robbed and plundered every man his neighbor. Before there was a law of Moses, they still wasn't able to steal, kill, or destroy, as well as his relatives. And they corrupted the whole earth, and the earth was full with was filled with violence. Now, was the people over here in the United States, or in the Americas, or in uh, South America? Was they full of violence because the people over there in the east was doing this? Of course not. They're talking about a, a providence that they know, a providence that they see, cities around them, close to them, not all the way around the whole earth. Understand the terminology of the Bible and who they're actually speaking about. And they corrupted the earth, and the earth was full of violence. And their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men, and took their wives by force. See, in one instance, we have, it was the angels. Here in the book of Jasher, the book of the upright ones, we have more of a literal uh, account. This was actually people that were created, uh, people who was supposed to be the judges and rulers over the society. They were the ones who came from the line of uh, the heavenly line of Methuselah and all them. And, uh, sorry, Seth and all them. But anyway, these were heavenly people, right? These were the people that, that they got the, um, the oracles passed down from Enoch until, uh, you know, Methuselah and Seth and blah, blah, this and that. Uh, and in, in the order, you can check the order out. But anyway, these are the people that knew the oracles uh, left by Enoch. Uh, and they were supposed to be the judges and rulers of the earth in order to get the children of Cain more settled. 
They were supposed to build up their own nation and get the children of Cain more settled. But let's see what happened. And their judges and rulers went into the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. See? And the sons of the men in those days took from the cattle of the earth the beasts of the fields and the fowls of the air and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other in order therewith to, prov to provoke the Lord. Why did they do it? In order therewith to provoke the Lord, to show the Most High that they knew how to create and they knew how to do things too. And they really didn't have to be dependent on the Most High and they can in fact create better animals than the Most High created. And God saw the whole earth, and it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted its ways unto the earth, all men and all the animals. So they had so many misbreed species out there that the Most High didn't want, and everybody was trying to create their own different type of animal, probably. And then they was, you know, beautifying the, the islands. They had this seductive stuff going on. And then they was robbing, pillaging, and all that stuff. So the Most High said, I will blot out my man that I created from the face of the earth, yea, from man to the birds of the air, together with cattle and beasts that are in the field, for I repent that I made them. And all men who walk in the ways of the Lord died in those days, but before the Lord brought the evil upon man which he had declared. So he let all the righteous men die before he killed the wicked man. Sounds more like going on in the Bible, right? For this was from the Lord, that they should not see the evil which the Lord spoke of concerning the sons of men. All right. So now, and we know we read the account out of Genesis earlier, but see, so we see what they're talking about now. So let's go to, let's go back. And hopefully I ain't lost anybody yet, because I know that this is kind of long and things. Uh, but it's good to break down some of these chapters in order to understand the Hebrew mindset, the Hebrew thought, and to, to actually go in there and, and cut up some of those verses and to hear the different perspectives so you know more of the Hebrew culture so you can bring that same culture when you read more of the scriptures. But anyway, so now... Let's go to Jude 7, and I'm going to end with 8. So we see uh, why the angels left their habitations and were reserved and were and was reserved in everlasting chains into darkness into the judgment of the great day. Verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and and going into after strange flesh, that's your homosexuality, are set forth for an example. So they all these places were set for as an example of what happened to wicked men through judgment of the most high. Especially this right here. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities. Look, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Let's see it down here. Eternal, perpetual, forever, everlasting. And you know what fire is. So, this was supposed to be everlasting fire. And I, I got this for a reason. So even though it says everlasting fire, or eternal fire, is the fire in Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, is it still lit today? No. So once some for sometimes when you see words like eternal, forever, everlasting. Just know some of those have an expiration date. This is just how the Hebrews expressed things. It would seem 
like an eternity to those people that witnessed it. It's not saying that it's literally an, eternal, uh, an eternity, but to those people going through it and witnessing it, it would be an eternity to them. Put yourself in their predicament or in their position. But now, let's find out what happened with this Sodom and Gomorrah instance. Let's find out why the Most High had to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat at the in the gate of Sodom, and Lot seeing them rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold, now my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay. But we will abide in the street all night. See, Lot wanted them to come in the house. <laughs> they said, no, we're going to go see what's going on here. And he pressed upon them greatly. And they turned in unto him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast. And they did bake unleavened bread and they did eat. So he pressed them. It's a reason why Lot really wanted them to come in the house and not go around the city. But before they lay down, so they had enough time to go in the house, uh, cook the bread and eat the bread. Probably talk a little bit, but anyway. But before they lay down, the men of the city, indeed, or even, let me make sure that's uh, indeed, I keep saying that. that uh, four. I don't have it right there. I guess you can't do that even. But even usually mean indeed. But anyway, so. But it's added anyway because you see it's in italicized. But the men of Sodom come past the house round right about, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they call unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men that came in to thee this night? Bring them Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. Let's see here. What was that? No. Yada. Let's see here. See if I can uh, all right, I think I got it up now. It says to know, use in a great variety of senses, figuratively, literally, you feel some, you feel some stuff. You feel some statically. I don't know how to say that. And in spirituality, and spiritually, I don't know how to say that anymore. Anyway, including observation, care, recognition, instruction, designation, punishment, appoint, be aware, discern, discover. Let's, let's see here. Oh, no, let's see. No. I don't see if we can have any more definitions of it. 
Because all these are the same word. Yep, all these are the same word for no. So now, if we get one no, let me see if which call is here. Yep, right there. The same no right here is the same no in Jeremiah 31, 34 and said, I thought it was, that you uh, teach any neighbor to know the Lord. So, it's the same no. Now let's see if we can get a to know, to learn, to proceed, to discriminate, to consider, to be skillful, to be instructed, to make known. Because it seems like this ain't got nothing to do with sex. What was that, 3045? Oh, that's G3045. Sorry. I ain't got no Hebrews. Oh, he ain't got no Hebrews. Alright, so I think that's what's it. It got to 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 do with actually uh, knowing or perceiving. This is this is this isn't a this isn't a sexual thing in this matter. Now they might want to have sex with them, but that's not what this is talking about. says seeing. It's talking about seeing them. Observing them. Recognition. See, being acquaintance. It has nothing to do with sex right here. So, that same know the Lord and you would uh, know the Lord Now, when I looked it up, that no in Greek is a different type of no. Uh, it meant more dealing with marriage. So I guess that'll be something to look up, actually deal with later. Because the same word thing in Greek is more dealing with marriage and company. And this one is dealing with uh, recognition or observing. So, anyway. Let me get back to that. Uh, so we could know him, know them. A lot went out of the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brother, do not do so wickedly. Behold, now I have two dollars which have not known man. Well, let's just see here. A lot is trying to give us more of a what this meaning no is. Oh, uh, it's the same word. 30 H3045. Uh, let's see here. Yep, H3045. So, right now, this has got to be talking about, it's pointing to me something sexual. Because he said, I have had, I got two daughters that have not been acquainted with men. So Lot is talking about, it look like to me, he's talking about something sexual. But anyway, behold, now I have two dogs which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do to them as is good in yourselves. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof 
And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. So Lot was a sojourner. They said, you're, you're, a, you're a visitor. How can you be a judge? Now we will deal worse with thee than that with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. I'm not, it could be sexual, but I'm seeing more of conversation here. But I will tell you why in just a second, once we keep reading. But I see more of a conversation of uh, them being wickedly, them wanting to rob them and maybe do all this stuff. I don't think it's sexually, but let's keep reading and see. I think they would just want to be unrighteous. Rob them, kill them, destroy them, anything. I don't know if it's sexually because the definition doesn't prove point towards sex. But let's keep going. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place. Because the cry, once again, why did the Most High... So why did the Most High destroy um, the earth in the flood? Because the cry of those souls reached unto the heaven's gate. Why did he destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Because the cry of them is waxing grace before the face of the Lord. Why did he destroy Jerusalem on that final judgment? Because the souls of those under the altar was crying unto him, How long before you avenge us, Father? You see? These are the saints crying. They're crying unto the Most High. They're crying because people are being wicked to them. Once you make it into the kingdom of heaven, no more crying, no more groaning, no more complaining. All tears are wiped away. You are in the heavenly Jerusalem, the one not made with hands. But anyway, I can go into a whole discussion about that. But anyway, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons and laws, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place. For the Lord will destroy the city, but he seemed as but he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons and laws. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the sea. One second. Let's see. Let's see. Lest I'll be consumed in the iniquity of the city. So they weren't going to wait on Lot to decide when he wanted to come and go. It was going to happen regardless. But anyway, I know I say anyway a lot, but y'all got me. Verse 16, And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hands of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. So he was lingering, right? And they grabbed hold of him and brought him out. Because the Lord was being merciful enough to let the angels drag him out of the city and destroy the city. But the destruction wasn't going to stop. They weren't waiting on him to get it together. So they forced him out of the city so, he could, so they could destroy the city. And look, they lay hand on him, the hand on his wife, and his two daughters. So it looks like uh, the angels had one uh, uh, person on each hand, in each hand, and sent him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountains. So they had to flee to the mountain. This was a common theme. Flee to the mountain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my lord, 
Behold, now thy servant has found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou came, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. We got escaping to the mountain again. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. It is not a little one. Oh, sorry. And it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. It is it not a little one, and my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city, for thou which thou hast spoken, hast thee escape, has hastily escaped thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore, the name of that city was called Zor. So now we have right here. Oh, okay. So they couldn't bring any punishment upon at all until Lot was safe. Okay, then, okay, okay. So the punishment was coming, the destruction was coming, but it couldn't come about till Lot was actually safe. I got it now. Earlier I said that it was going to come regardless, which it was going to come regardless, but they was waiting on, I said they wasn't waiting on Lot, but they actually was waiting on Lot from the grace. So I, I got to recant that. They was waiting on Lot to be safe, but it was coming, so if they didn't take hold of Lot and throw him out the city. It seems like that either the city was going to be spared a little longer or Lot might have got caught up in it. I don't know. But I know it was uh, Lot just saved a city. Because they wanted him to go into the mountains, but Lot thought that if something evil was going to happen to him while he was running into the mountain. So they, he said, let me go into that city. So they said, okay, well, you can go into that city. So it looked like Lot was able to uh, save that little city. All right, so now let's see here. The sun was risen up upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from, be from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. So now, we have Lot running and the sun uh, rose up when he entered into Zoar. So they was running for a while, probably, it seems. Let's see here. Yep, he had the morning rising right there. And then you got them throwing light out the city. And then you got the sun rising up. Okay, so you got... Uh, I'm trying to get the timeline here. We got the morning, which will be the sun. And then you got the sun rising up again. So it looked like this was a day. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone, and he overthrew those cities. But his wife looked back from behind him. So she looked back. After all of that running and stuff, she looked back because of uh, Probably a lot of her friend, friends and stuff would be destroyed. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he uh, and he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all of the land of the plain. And behold, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as a smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent light out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which light dwelt. All right, so we got that. Oh, that was a lot to take in, y'all. That was a lot to take in, but we're not done. 
Not done at all, not just yet. So now, let's see some of this is being played out, right? We got the Book of Jubilees. Verse 3. This is about uh, when they prophesied to Abraham that Sarah was going to be pregnant, right? So, and when he told her the name of her son, as it is written on the tablets of heaven, namely Isaac, as his name, and when he returned to her in a fixed time, then she, were, then she was pregnant with son. And in this month, the Lord carried out the judgments, with an S, of Sodom and Gomorrah and Sibrium and all the circuit of the Jordan. And burnt them with fire and brimstone, and demolished them unto the present day, until that day that the author of Jubilees was writing, which is supposed to be Moses and him getting the uh, the tablets and the Torah on Mount Sinai, according to all to what we have made known to thee concerning all of their actions, that they were terrible. And very sinful, and they defiled themselves and committed fornication and uncleanliness over the earth. What happened? Why was um, the people of the uh, why was the angels destroyed or those men that was upon earth because of fornication spreading about and uncleanliness? being spread about all unrighteousness so the most high did a, a a judgment a fairly good sized judgment for those committing fornication and being unclean let's see and accordingly the Lord inflicted judgment upon all the places by the hand of his servants according to the uncleanliness of Sodom According to the judgment of Sodom. Let's see if I can find here real fast. We're going to uh, go into Jasher now. And we're going to read a little bit. Let's read a little bit more about the details of what all was going on in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Because a lot of people just want to talk, oh, homosexuality, this, this, and that. So it seems like it's kind of being debunked about the homosexuality. But a sodomite uh, was a male prostitute. So I'm pretty sure it was something similar going on in Sodom. But anyway, let's just see here. Now I'm not saying homosexuality is right. I'm saying that it's not showing that that's what the Bible is speaking on in that instance. Now we know we read different uh, later on about the homosexuality. But... Joshua 19, 1, and the cities of Sodom had four judges to four cities, and these were their names, Serac in the city of Sodom, Sharkar in Gomorrah, Zabnak in Abna, and Minnah in Zebulun. And Eleazar, Abraham's servant, applied to them different names, and he converted Serac to Shakra, and Sharkar to Shakura, and Zabnak to Kizabim, and Menon to Maxlagan. And by desire of their four judges, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah 
had beds erected in the streets of the cities. And if a man came to these places, they laid hold of him and brought him to one of their beds and by force made him to lie in them. And as he lay down, three men would, stood, would, would stand at his head and three at his feet and measure him by the length of the bed. And if a man was less than the bed, these six would stretch him at, every, at each end. And when he cried out to them, they would not answer him. And if he was longer than the bed, they would draw together the two sides of the bed at each end until the man had reached the gates of death. And he continued, and if he continued to cry out to them, they would answer him saying, Thus said, thus shall it be done to a man that cometh into our land. So y'all see this unrighteousness that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah was doing? But anyway, let's keep reading. And when man heard all these things that the people of the cities of Sodom did, they refrained from coming there. And when a poor man came to their land, they would give him silver and gold and cause a proclamation in the whole city not to give him a morsel of bread to eat. And if the stranger should remain there some days and die from hunger, not having been able to obtain a morsel of bread, then at his death all the people of the city would come and take their silver and gold which they had given to him. So they would give him money, right? But then when nobody would sell him anything to eat, so he would starve to death. All right, so let me make sure that uh, I have volume here. Just trying to see if I got some volume. Any volume? Sorry, I'm trying to see if I got volume. Any volume? Okay, I got some. I got it. I got it. I got it. All right. So now, let's keep reading about what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. I gotta cut down my phone. I don't want to interrupt it. Sorry. So now, verse nine. And those that could recognize the silver or gold which they had given him took it back. And at his death, they also stripped him of his garments. And they would fight about them, and he that prevailed over his neighbor took them. They would, after that, carry him and bury him under some of the shrubs in the deserts. So they did all the days to anyone that came to them and died in their land. So you see the wickedness that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 24, and at that time the wife of Lot bare him a daughter, and he called her name Paltoth, saying, Because God had delivered him the whole household from the kings of Elam, and Paltoth, sorry, Paltoth, daughter of Lot, grew up, and one of the men of Sodom took her for a wife. And a poor man came into the city to seek a maintenance, and he remained in the city some days. And all the people of Sodom caused a proclamation of their customs not to give this man a morsel of bread to eat until he dropped dead into the earth, and they did so. And Pothus, the daughter of Lot, saw this man lying in the street, starved with hunger, and no man would give him anything to keep him alive, and he was just upon the point of death, and her soul was filled with pity on the on account of the man, and she fed him secretly with bread for many days, and the soul of this man was revived. For when she went forth to fetch water, she would put the bread in the water pitcher, and when she came to the place where the poor man was, she took the bread from the pitcher and gave it to him to eat. So she did many days. Of course she didn't want to see him starve to death, right? And all the people of Sodom and Gomorrah wondered how this man could bear starvation for so many days. 
And they said to each other, this can only be that he eats and drinks, for no man can be starvation for so many days or live as this man has, without even his countenance changing. And three men concealed themselves in a place where the poor man was stationed, to know who it was that brought him bread to eat. And Paul, the daughter of Lot, went forth that day to fetch water, and she put bread into her pitcher of water, and she went to draw water by the poor man's place. And she took out the bread from the pitcher and gave it to the poor man, and he ate it. And the three men saw what Paul did to the poor man, and they said to her, It is thou, it is thou then who has supported him, and therefore he has not starved, nor changed in appearance, nor died like the rest. And the three men went out of the place in which they were concealed, and they seized Paltif and the bread which was in the poor man's hand. And they took Paltif and brought her before their judges, and they said to them, Thus did she do, and it was she who supplied the poor man with bread. Therefore did he not die all this time. Now therefore declare unto us the punishment due to this woman for having transgressed our law. And the people of Sodom and Gomorrah assembled and kindled a fire in the street of the city. And they took the woman and cast her into the fire, and she was burned to ashes. Mm. And let's keep reading. And in the city of Akma, so this is another city, there was a woman to whom they did the like. So what this was uh this was Lot's daughter they killed. So now for a traveler came into the city of Adma to abide there all night with the attentions of going home in the morning. And he sat opposite of the door of the house of the young woman's father to remain there. As the son had said when he reached the uh, place, and the young woman saw him standing, uh, sorry, sorry, saw him sitting by the door of the house. And he asked her for a drink of water, and she said to him, Who art thou? And he said to her, I was this day going on the road and reached here, when the sun set, so I will abide here all night, and in the morning I will arise early and continue my journey. And the young woman went into the house and fetched the man bread and water to eat and drink. And this affair became known to the people of Adma, and they assembled and brought the young woman before the judges, that they should judge her for this act. 41. And the judge said, the judgment of death must pass upon this woman because she transgressed our law, and this therefore is the decision concerning her. And the people of this and the people of those cities assembled and brought out the young woman and anointed her with honey from head to foot, as the judge as the judge sorry, as the judge has decreed. And they placed her before a swarm of bees which were there in their hives. And the bees flew upon her and stung her that her whole body was swell. And the young woman cried out on account of the bees, but no one took notice of her or pitied her. And her cries ascended to heaven. And the Lord was provoked at this and at all the works of the cities of Sodom. For they had abundance of food and had tranquility amongst them, and still would not sustain the poor and the needy. And in those days, their evils doing, their evil doings and sins became greater before the Lord. And the Lord sent forth two angels that had come to Abraham's house to destroy Sodom and the cities. So what happened? The Most High heard all of that wickedness. Look, they were burning people alive for 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 helping um, uh, uh, the poor. This man was just there for one day. They took bee, they took honey, and put it all over this lady, and put her in front of a beehive, and let the bees sting her until her whole body uh, uh, swelled up. So the Most High had to visit Sodom and Gomorrah for this because look how they was acting. 
This is the type of wickedness that the that mankind was doing back then. No one was doing good. You see, these are the law. These were the laws in their city, which means everybody in the city was either on one accord with the laws, or they was being killed for not being unrighteous, as you can see. So the Most High had to do something about this. And let's see here. Um, Okay, yeah, so it don't go into detail right here uh, about the man wanting to uh, have sex with, with Lot, I mean, with the angels or anything. So, I think that's just something we might be reading into it when it said no, because we know in the New Testament, when somebody was knowing another person, it mainly dealt with uh, sexual things or, or um, a covenant. But right here, it just seems like it's more about recognition. And you can see why uh, they will want to uh, get to these people. Because they had customs in the land. And I'm surprised that, that Lot, but Lot was one of the uh, sojourners, so he was there earlier. But I'm surprised Lot was able to survive as long as he was able to survive there, being a sojourner. But these angels who came, no, they had some customs that they had to do. They, and, they, and they told Lot, we might do worse to you than we do to them. Now bring them out. I ain't no telling what they was going to try to do to no men. But we see the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the point was, let me get back to where I was at. So the point was to show while all of these people were doing unrighteousness and they had a judgment come upon them. And, the, and these judgments were supposed to be put in the remembrance of everybody that understood the Hebrew culture and nation uh, and uh, the Hebrew culture and, uh, sorry, and their covenants in the first century. They were supposed to uh, be able to recollect all of these stories on why the wicked was destroyed. And make them do better. But it pretty much did the opposite. So I'm going to go to my final chapter. My final chapter that I'm going over today. Which will be Jude 8. And I'm going to wrap it up with Jude 8. Now. So we know that the eternal fire was not an everlasting fire. It had an end, and we see uh, it said, Sodom and Gomorrah gave themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. So I think they're going after strange flesh right there. Uh, to me, it's more going toward homosexuality. But once you get into this, the backstories, it seems like it dealt more with them being unrighteous to man and, and killing men and all that stuff. So I say that probably deserves a closer case, a closer case study. But right now I'm just telling you what these Hebrew accounts say. So that's not my goal in this story or this understanding right now or this teaching. So now, do you want to likewise also these filthy dreamers? defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. So, to end it with uh, this understanding, because this is all the wicked things that those people in the first generation was doing. All of those wicked people in the first generation was doing this. So, this is pretty much the end of all that we're going to go to today. But let's try to break this down, exactly what was going on and what exactly is meant by these verses. So now, I'm pretty sure uh, Jude got a lot, uh, the author got a lot of this stuff from Peter. But anyway, but chiefly, 
them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanliness and despise government. Presumptuous are they. self will They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. So, let's see here. That would be glory, uh, praise, worship. So this will be worship or praise or the glory. They do. They were not afraid to speak evil, to defame, to derail, to blas uh, blaspheme the glory. So these people were not was not afraid was not afraid to blaspheme the power of Christ and the power of the Father and the covenant, the new covenant, even the Mosaic covenant. These were people out for themselves. They were they was worried more about their their uh, their power in society that they didn't care about anything else. They didn't care to blaspheme the government or the uh, or the holiness. Let's see here. The, the, the dominion. Look, they was arrogant. Self-pleasing. They thought they were right. This was, these are the Pharisees up and down. And those people. The people that was bringing in the heresies. The people that was persecuting the saints. But anyway. Let's keep this go back. So now let's go to X twenty three four. We'll start at 21. And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good countries before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto, God, unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law? And command and commandest me to be spent contrary to the law, and they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I was not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. So now, who was the ruler of the Israelites? The high priest. The high priest was the ruler of the Israelites. And even though the high priest was wicked and wanted, even uh, commanded the people beside Paul to smite his lips, what did, he, what did they ask him? Revilest thou God's high priest? And let's see, let's see what that is. That means reproach, revile, reproach, revile. So, do you reproach the high priest? And Paul said, I will. Not. See, he didn't speak against the government. He didn't hate. I mean, he didn't not not like being under that uh, authority. Because he, well, he knew the true authority that he was under, which was Christ. 
and the fathers. But he understood the the, uh, the how things were set up in the Mosaic Covenant. So even though he was living for Christ and he had a, the mission of Christ, he did not go against the grain of the Mosaic Covenant, nor did he despise leadership or rulership. He never said, hey, I'm going to do my own thing, forget what the Pharisees, Sadducees, and all of them was talking about. No, he did everything in decent, in decency and in order. So as you can tell right there, he was one of the ones that did not despise government. Everybody else despised government. They despised the people that was over them. Even the high priest despised Rome that was over them. They wanted to keep the, the, uh, their power through Rome, but they really didn't get along with Rome at all. But now let's see... Uh, He said, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants. And we saw uh, uh, earlier where in a different uh, passage, something dealing with the ten virgins. But anyway, his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. They despise government. These people despise government. They despise the Christ, the king. They despise the dominion over them. They will speak evil of his glory, of his kingship. We would not have this man reign over us. They asked Paul, do you speak, do you want to reproach the man over you? Paul said, no, because it is written not to do that. They didn't care about none of that. It was prophesied that a king, the king would come and restore the things into Israel. But they did not want that king. They didn't want Christ. Therefore, they spoke evil of everything that he stood for. And when they speak, when they spoke evil of everything Christ uh, stood for, by default, they spoke evil of the Father and everything he stood for. So now, let's Let's finish up. Exodus 22, 28. Let's see what's going on. All of the things, and it says laws about social justice. One of the things that Moses said to him was what? Thou shalt not revive the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. Let's see. Uh, The Elohim, the Supreme God, the Magistrate. So this is Elohim here. So now, let's go back since we've got the, the, the correct root word, the Elohim. So now... Thou shall not revive the Elohims, nor curse the ruler of thy people. 
So they were always expected. It was written in the Torah from the beginning. They were expected not to hate dominion, those that have dominion over them. They were not to despise the rulers over them. But the Israelites in the first century, they transgressed all of that. They did not care about the, the way that the Most High had everything set up. They didn't care about the covenant. They forgot all of the wicked, unrighteous deeds of the people in the past and the judgment that came for those wicked deeds. They were saying that, what did they say? We were never slaves. We have no king except Caesar. Let his blood be upon our heads. They didn't care about nothing in the first century. They were the unfroward, wicked, crooked generation that had to be destroyed, bringing in the new covenant with nothing but saints rule and reign. We are reading the Bible in the fulfillment of the wicked people, those wicked people, that generation. So, we was able to go through Jude 1 through 8 and to get the backstory of most of the verses. Hopefully we have a better understanding of what was going on and I plan on doing, I guess, 9 through 16 and then finish it up uh, uh, 17, 17 through Whatever it was, how much is it? Let's see here. 17 through, I think it's 24. No, 25. 17 through 25. And I will be done with my June series, and hopefully, we see what's all going on and what was happening in the first century, and how everything was getting ready to get wrapped up, and how uh, we need to go to, uh, we need to go through the uh, Hebrew history in order to understand the mindset and the mind frame that everybody was in during the time of uh, pre-restoration, if that makes sense. But anyway, thank you all for listening. I love you all. If you have any questions, just leave on the comments and I will answer accordingly. Uh, I know... Uh, I've been talking a long time. I'm about three hours in this thing. This is like one of the longest videos I have ever done. Uh, so thank y'all for listening. Um, Assembly of Sound Doctrine Channel. That's uh, my little group that I have going on. I'm still under the guise of Mr. William Bell. He's my mentor. Um... I go to I attend his church. You know, I'm a Hebrew Israelite. We don't even go to churches, but uh, Mr. Mr. Bell, he was uh, so defined in his knowledge that you know I had to uh, whatever he was involved in I had to be a part of because I got to soak up all of that knowledge and all of that that um, uh, information that I had confused and I misplaced and all that anger that I had built up. And uh, it, it was able to leave and be replaced by more righteous deeds, more righteous way of living, more righteous thoughts. Uh, no more worried about the letter, but worried about the righteousness, worried about the spiritual sacrifices, worried about uh, pleasing Christ and the Father. So, um, you know, all praise to the Most High for uh, waking me up. I had uh, a, a long progress, you know. I have, I've been through... Um, Church of God in Christ, to not believe in the church no more, to question God, to believe in uh, to pro-blackness, to Hebrew Israelite, uh, Hebrew uh, Israelism, whatever you want to call it, to full preterists, and I have stuck here in full preterists. I have went through all aspects I could in order to debunk it. I couldn't debunk it, and it's true. And I now it's, it's so easy. I feel a caveman can do it because all you got to do is believe the words that Christ in the, in the Bible said. All things has been fulfilled. This is a history book. Uh, we are in the kingdom of heaven. So right now, our deeds 
are being reported to the Most High. And we're being, uh, our deeds are being written in the heavenly table. And who knows? I mean, really, who knows, man? Maybe a thousand years from now, they'll be reading about some of us and how we uh, snapped out and came back into the original doctrine. So who knows? But thank y'all for listening. Uh, similar sound document, Chandler, A O S D C H A N D L E R. Add me on YouTube if you know anybody that want to debate, because I'm a debater also. Uh, let me know. But it's not all about debating. At the end of the day, it's about uh, worshiping Christ, the King, pleasing the Father through the faith in His Son, uh, believing on His Son. And believing that the Son is the mediator to the Father. And we get all the blessings that the Father wants to give us if we do the things he said. Hopefully that all made sense. Um, thanks for listening. I like to say, uh, have hardly uh, shalom shalom on this beautiful Saturday. All right.